evening to you. How are you doing? I really hope that you've been having an awesome Holy Thursday. Yes, it's Thursday and you know not very often do we get this chance or opportunity to speak thus saith the Lord or to just literally just talk based on what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to us on a Thursday. So I just want to welcome you even as you join. Um, it's such an honor, such a blessing, divine will, divine appointment, and we give God all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. I'm truly, truly grateful. I'm truly grateful. We ought to be grateful because there are many persons who are living in places where they are desperate, they're hungry, hungry to hear from the Lord, hungry to hear their favorite scriptures being read, hungry for a word of prayer. They're hungry to bask into the presence of God because their conditions or the environment in which they are are simply not conducive to worship, prayer, intimacy, or moments with the Lord. So we dare not take it for granted. Good evening to you, Trisha. Good evening to you, Sister Eileen, Sister Trisha. Um, good evening to you, all those who have joined. I'm not seeing all the names, but if you could just say hi to me, then I'll be able to recognize you by your names. To God be the glory. You know, today I was actually in the restroom and I was talking to the Lord like I usually do. And he started to speak to me about Jerusalem. Glory to God. Now, many of us, we would have read the scriptures and we've heard of Jerusalem so many times. And we've even sang it in songs. There's a song that goes like this. Jerusalem and so on and so forth but how many times or how many of us have really taken the time out to wonder the significance of this place called jerusalem tonight i'm going to highlight through the holy spirit something is a very profound revelation that i got that has to do with uh, jerusalem this place that we have pronounced that we have read about that we have spoken of so often there is something very significant about it and perhaps you and i have a jerusalem so we're gonna look at it as it relates to the life of jesus and see how it is necessary in our lives today can we do that real quick kevin good evening to you hi shane so father we thank you so much again for this opportunity lord we worship your name we bow down before you king of kings and lord of lords you are alpha you are omega beginning and the end the government was upon your shoulder indeed we thank you mighty god that by your stripes and your stripes only there are many persons who have been killed there are many persons who have been martyrs. There are many persons who have voluntarily given up their lives. But it was only by your stripes that we have been made healed or we have been made whole. So Father, we thank you tonight. We thank you that you are glorious. We thank you that you are still precious. We thank you, Father, that you are our soon coming King. We thank you that it was in a time and season such as this. When you were going through chastisement, you were going through a season, Lord, where you were being humbled, not just by your father, but also by men, by those in authorities, by the powers that be. Father God, we thank you so much that you have allowed yourself to be broken. You have allowed, allowed yourself to be humiliated. You have allowed yourself to be mocked, to be shamed, to be bruised, to be belittled, just so that your people, me, we can abound in confidence, in love, in grace, in peace, in joy, and in the Holy Ghost today. So we praise your name. We lift you up. We lift you up above all other names. We lift you up on social media. We lift you up, oh God, on every media that exists. Print, 
and otherwise we lift you up mighty God for you are worthy to be praised good evening sister Brenda hallelujah thank you Jesus so I want us to look real quick at Jerusalem I you might have seen in the title Jerusalem the place where purpose is realized by the way I want to accredit the teaching and the revelation that I'm about to give first to the Holy Spirit but I must say Kingdom Life School of the Supernatural Ministries Dr. Mangar I must acknowledge you and the teachings you have given Dr. Stephen as well I acknowledge you thank you so much for the impartation and the knowledge the wealth of knowledge that you have deposited not just in my life but also in the life of many who are aspiring ministers of the gospel of God glory to God now people of God I want to look at some very significant events and things that happened in this city called Jerusalem now if we go into the book of Matthew Mark Luke John the Gospels and even if we go as far as the book of Acts we'll realize that many cities were mentioned during the life and ministry of Jesus we've heard of Capernaum we have heard of um, call them Nazareth we have heard of Bethlehem we have heard of Judea we have heard of Samaria we have heard of Egypt we have heard of many places mentioned during the time of Jesus's life and ministry now we've also heard of Jerusalem now today the Holy Spirit wants us to look at the significance of this place called Jerusalem are you willing to do that now this is where I want to start. In Luke chapter 2, the word of God says that Jesus being a young child was presented before God in Jerusalem. How do we know that? Now we know that his parents, Mary and Joseph, they had to go down, glory to God, to Jerusalem because that's where Joseph was from even though they were living in Nazareth at the time when the angel appeared and said thou shalt get pregnant and have a son the Holy Spirit will come upon you all of that revelation and detail was given in Nazareth but now they need to go down to Jerusalem because a time came when the king at the time he sent out an order he sent out a decree and he said everybody ought to return to their city their original city and pay their taxes so that's how Joseph ended up in Jerusalem hallelujah so Joseph went down to Jerusalem and of course he went with his pregnant wife Mary at the time highly pregnant with Jesus now it happened that as and as you know in their culture if a woman got pregnant and she had a baby boy it would take her 40 days to be purified if she had a girl it would take her 80 days to be purified so they had what they called a period of purification so Mary had to go through this purification period for 40 days with Jesus now after she went through those 40 days a day came or the 40th day let's say on that day or the day after she took the young child into the temple the Word of God says she presented him to the Lord hallelujah now that word is so interesting she presented him now when you hear of her presenting Jesus to the Lord it's kind of similar to what we call dedicating our children today you know how you dedicate your child yes many children are dedicated meaning they're given to God meaning God becomes the sole owner of these persons or that's the intent and so Jesus as a young child was presented glory to God before God the Father so we understand already that Jerusalem is the place where one is given to God where one owns and, and where God owns an individual hallelujah so that's the first thing we notice as a, a significant thing about Jerusalem now the next thing that the Holy Spirit um, wants us to highlight about Jerusalem is that a man of God called Simeon and another woman of God she's called Anna 
both of them met Jesus in the temple being a young child. Now, if you look at Luke chapter 2, you'll recognize that Simeon, he spoke into Jesus's life. As a matter of fact, the Lord God, through the Holy Spirit, would have promised Simeon that he would not have seen death or he would not have died until he beheld the salvation of the Lord. And you and I know who the salvation was. The salvation was and still is Jesus. So baby Jesus, he saw at a very tender age or even when he was about to depart from this life that Simeon he saw Jesus he didn't just see him with his two eyes but he got the chance to touch salvation he got the chance to feel salvation he got the chance to experience salvation lucky you Simeon many persons wished they were in your shoes but we thank God nevertheless glory to God so Simeon got to speak into the life of Jesus. Now, not only that, the prophetess Anna, who dedicated herself to prayer and fasting at the time, she too got the opportunity to see Jesus. And she too got the opportunity to prophesy over his life as the Holy Spirit gave her utterance. Now, here's the thing. So Jerusalem is one, the place where God owns you, where God shows ownership of you, but it, it's also the place where God allows people to recognize or get a revelation of who you are. So Simeon got a, re a revelation of Jesus. Anna, she got a revelation of Jesus. And because they knew who Jesus was based on the revelation given to them by the Holy Spirit, they were able to speak into his life accordingly. They were able to prophesy over his life accordingly. Now, similarly, as it relates to us, I believe God is saying to us, I believe God is saying to us, we too have a Jerusalem. It is that place, glory to God, where one, God says to us, he's owning us. It's the place where he comes into covenant with us. And two, I believe that at our Jerusalem, wherever it is, we're coming to it because I'm going to ask you that question. It is the place where God would align us with some men and women of his, men of God, women of God. Every now and then he would send them to us and they'll just speak and prophesy stuff over our lives. I mean, maybe if you go to X or if you go down south, you would never find somebody who would come up to you and say, God says, or I see you doing this and that later on in your life and so on and so forth but when you go to south you realize that if you go in the market somebody says i know you or there's something about you or when you go to the bank you happen to be favored in the bank and people don't know why they favor you and all these things keep on happening when you're in a certain place you notice that these favors and these kinds of manifestations they only occur when you're in the city or maybe when you're in in the country for many persons like myself maybe when you go back to rural Jamaica like for me when I go back to St. Anne or maybe for you when you go back to St. Thomas or wherever but it is that place where God would have strategically placed persons to speak over your life and they're speaking words of truth because even though your situation might not look like you're going to be that pastor or you're going to be that wealthy person or that business oriented person persons that they're talking about it is indeed words of truth that God would permit them to speak over your life even from a very tender age so that's number two the second point as it relates to what happens in Jerusalem now the the third thing that happens in Jerusalem is that in Luke chapter 2 yet again toward the end part it says that Jesus was left behind yeah so his mother and father, they left, they did what they needed to do, which was to pay taxes. But after they did the paying of the taxes, you know, they were going on their way back home. Where did I say they're from? They're going back to Nazareth, perhaps. Yeah, because they've done what they needed to do in Jerusalem. But this little boy, this little inquisitive, brilliant, intelligent young man was left behind, I would want to say intentionally, in the temple and what was he found to do when his mother and father found him he was found in the midst of the 
the, the intelligent of the society, you know, the intellectually inclined, they are well schooled, they are well learned, you know, these are men who are brilliant and they know the, the, the word or the Bible back to front. Now the Bible for those men was only the Old Testament because of course the New Testament was by this time in the making so it was not yet written. But these men were so well studied and might I add so religious that it's like they got everything correct as it related to knowing the Word of God. See that's the funny thing. They knew the scripture but they just didn't practice what they were taught or they didn't practice what they read. They were simply just pious, yes, and very, very just religious in their thinking, in their way of life, in their posture, in every way. They were just religious. But anyways, that's another subject. So they found little Jesus in their midst, questioning these so-called intelligent men, asking them things that they should have known. But the word of God says that there was something about what he was asking them. You know why? Because they marveled. And especially because of his age. Where did this little boy get those questions from? How does he reason at such a high and deep level? He's not a university student. Where did he get all this knowledge from to even ask us such deep questions that not even us ever thought of? So we realize that from a very young age or tender age, the Lord Jesus was now manifesting. Glory to God, manifesting. Now guess what? Similarly, I wanna, each time I touch a topic, I wanna just relate. I want us to relate. Many of us, we would have been manifesting from a very tender age. Maybe when you were younger, after you come home from Sunday school, you would start to beat the zinc, the board and the chairs pretending as though they were people. For many of us, we would be preaching to the air or preaching to the tree because that thing was starting to manifest. We just didn't know it yet that in the future, we were gonna have a teaching ministry, a preaching ministry and so on and so forth. Now, I say this before and I'll say it again. I remember when I was very young, I think I was about five, six years of age. I remember going to school one day and we were playing a particular game. I don't know if you remember, there's a game where you put some papers on your finger and you say, Simon, how you go? Some tweety, tweety bird, fly away, Peter, fly away, Paul. You remember that? Yes. And we were playing some games back to back. Now, after we played the fly away Peter, fly away Paul, we played this game of magic, abracadabra. Are you hearing me? I want you to listen up very carefully. I was playing with someone and we were playing with one of those um, popcorn ring. If you're as old as I am, You'd remember that when we were going to primary school, elementary school for persons who are living overseas, that they would have sold us some popcorns and in those packets of popcorns or packs of popcorns would be a ring. So when we finished having snacks, we took out the popcorn, the, the ring rather, and we were now playing this game of magic. How this game um, of magic worked was that one somebody held it in their hand and the person to whom the magic was going to be played or done they'd have to close their eyes while the next individual say abracadabra what they would do is while the person's eyes are closed is they would take out the ring out of the hand and hide the ring somewhere hide it somewhere and then say ta-da and when you look in the person's hand there was no ring and that was the trick it full full but as kids it was very entertaining and we did it over and over again but there was one particular day a very interesting day when something happened and even now today many many years later maybe 20 years later i am remembering it because it was so profound now guess what 
when it was my turn to hold the ring in my hand and to play magic with this person there was a voice to be honest with you from I was a child there was always this voice I'm sweating I don't have no AC so please <laughs> but there was always this voice that is high princess that is um speaking to me was always speaking to me it was like an inner voice like I don't know it was just always talking to me and telling me good things and directing me but as a child you just didn't know how to appreciate the voice and you didn't know how to attribute the voice because you're a child and I remember the voice said to me if you believe that when she opens her eyes and when you open your hands that the ring will not be there I guarantee you it will not be there you see I want to point out something to you the Word of God says that if you would only accept the kingdom as a child then surely you will inherit it you see children they, they, they are easily taught they learn quickly and they are so vulnerable they're not too hard they're not too stubborn they're teachable they can be corrected and so on and so forth that's why God loves to compare his children with literal children because it takes a great level of humility for one to hear what is deemed as a stupid advice and follow it nonetheless so I heard the voice say if you believe that this thing is gonna disappear then when you open your hand there will not be a ring and people of God let me tell you something I believed with every muscle every tissue every bone every socket everything inside of me believed at that moment that once I opened my hands there was not going to be a ring so of course when I opened my hand I expected to see an, an empty hand and did you know that when I opened my hand there was absolutely no ring I was astonished the girl with whom I was playing she too was astonished why because there was no ring and the thing is the thing is gone how will we get back this ring it's, it took faith for it to disappear and now it's gonna take faith for it to come back this girl I don't even know if today she she really believes me I did not remove the ring from my hands my faith caused it to disappear it wasn't no magical trick it was faith and so years later when I gave my life to the Lord the Holy Spirit let me know that guess what that was manifestation from a tender age and so many of us we have been manifesting from a young age as who we really are or as the people we were called to be it's just that when we are young we're in our fledgling state we are in our immature and infancy state the thing is just surface level it not it's not yet deep because we we're not far into it just yet and so this baby Jesus or little boy Jesus at 12 years of age was now manifesting glory to God <clears throat> so the next point that I want to highlight is that Jerusalem is the place of manifestation and you're gonna see that it's not just early manifestation but for some reason whenever you go to this particular place in this particular city or area or community it's like you just start manifest have you ever found yourself like whenever you go to a particular community it's like you find yourself speaking into the lives of the youth speaking into the lives of the young women not like you plan to but you just it's like you can't help yourself perhaps that's your Jerusalem because the question I'm gonna ask at the end of pointing out the different uh, manifestations or events that took place in Jerusalem is I'm gonna ask you where is your Jerusalem hallelujah so not only was there early or childhood manifestation in Jesus's life but we saw where a lot of miracles were done in Jerusalem one of the greatest miracles 
that have happened in Jerusalem is the one with the fig tree. Many people, Christians, non-Christians, are still trying to fathom that miracle. How is it that God spoke words, breath, air, to a tree, and the tree responded? It's hard for one to fathom. It's hard. Jesus only said, curse, I curse you because you're not producing. I'm cursing you because you're good for nothing. You're not producing, so you ought to be cursed. And he cursed it not by physically chopping it down, but just by spoken words. And the tree, the fig tree heard. The words became life. The words took root or manifested in the life of the tree. And there goes our response, it died. So the very word that he pronounced, it became life, it manifested, there was death. So major miracles occurred in Jerusalem. Another miracle that occurred in Jerusalem is do we remember the story when Jesus said, woman, um, thou art loosed? Do you remember that? Woman, thou art loosed? Yes. That woman was also in Jerusalem or that miracle also took place in Jerusalem when Jesus said, woman, thou art loosed. Hallelujah. So Jerusalem was a place where manifestation was occurring, not just in his childhood state, but also as an adult. Now, I don't know where your Jerusalem is, but could it be that place where not only did you begin to manifest as a child, but even as an adult, and I'm speaking also to persons who are not yet Christians because I was manifesting before I became a Christian, and maybe you were manifesting before you became a Christian, before you even knew that the call of God was upon your life. Hallelujah. So great miracles occur. See, here's the thing. The word of God says that the gifts of God are irrevocable. It means that many of us, we are born with the gifts. And so the gifts will be operational in our lives. So even though you're not yet a child of God because you have not yet surrendered, you have not yet been baptized, maybe if you pray for somebody who is sick, they will recover. Why? Because you have the gift of healing in your life. Maybe you are able to prophesy. Why? Because the gift of prophecy is on your life. Remember now, we're talking about gifts and not anointings now. Gifts given to you by the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Maybe you're able to interpret dreams. That's a gift. You're not a born-again Christian. You've never been baptized. But you're able to accurately interpret somebody's dreams. We're talking about gifts. Hallelujah. So I'm saying perhaps your Jerusalem is that place where whenever you go, it's like your gifts become activated without you even having to try too hard. Maybe you find yourself just literally praying for people and speaking into people's lives. And the last time you went to church is probably two months ago. So we're seeing activation of gifts when you go to your Jerusalem. Now, as I speak and as we point out the different events that occur in Jerusalem, as it was in Jesus' life, I want you to also reflect on that place physically right now that geographical place right now where you you find that whenever you go there god send people for tell you about your future or you keep on manifesting it's like you become a different person when you're at that place maybe whenever you go to tivoli for some reason you just feel like a different person all of a sudden you feel like an ambassador you start talking in the lives of youth and so on and so forth i want you to ask the holy spirit to bring to your mind your jerusalem because there's something significant i'm getting there here's the other point as we go toward um what the holy spirit wants to reveal now jesus this is very important Another important thing <clears throat> that occurred in Jerusalem is that Jesus cleansed the temple in Jerusalem. Again, there was Samaria, there was Capernaum, there was um, Nazareth. There were so many towns and cities mentioned in those days or that made up old Palestine. 
but we're highlighting Jerusalem because of its significance. Jesus cleansed the temple in Jerusalem. <clears throat> Do you remember that story when he went into the church and him took out the money, ch um, the money changers and him tell them to come out and turn over the, the things and even the dove was let out and all kind of things because a lot, a lot of transactions and business activities were occurring in the church. But Jesus went in it, the temple, and he cleansed it. Now, today, the Holy Spirit said that the reason Jesus could have done that in Jerusalem and maybe not in Samaria, even though there wasn't a temple in Samaria, but God wanted us to realize something. Why didn't Jesus be angry with money changers in Nazareth? Why didn't he kick over them things when they were using the people, tricking them and robbing them? Why didn't he do that? Why didn't he do it in another town, in Egypt? Why Jerusalem? What was the significance of Jesus cleansing the temple in Jerusalem? What the Holy Spirit revealed is that Jerusalem was the place over which Jesus Christ was given governmental authority. Ah, Jesus had governmental authority over Jerusalem. Who gave it to him? His father. So that's the reason why he, not being a resident of the town, could go into the town and could take authority over those things and persons who were given authority by men. But Jesus' authority was so far above theirs. Hallelujah. So your Jerusalem is the place over which you have been given authority. It means that in the physical, when you go to that place, hallelujah, respect is given to you. And even if you don't see it in the natural, the moment you open up your mouth when you're in that vicinity, things change. Atmospheres change. Because God would have anointed you and would have put some governmental authority upon you over that region, over that town, that city, or that community. Again, where is your Jerusalem? Hallelujah. So, are you learning? Princess, learning anything? Simon, are you learning anything? So, just to give you some reference for the, the changing or the casting out of uh, the persons that were selling in the temple, you can look in John chapter 2, verse 14. You can look at Mark chapter 11, verse 15 to 19. You can also look at Luke chapter 10, I believe, or 19, uh, verse 15. 45 to 48 I need to double check that because I cannot even figure out my writing right there but again Jerusalem is the place over which you have been given authority hallelujah you might not be living in that place right now hmm yes but when you go before your father in your closet to pray when you mention that place Wherever your Jerusalem is, let's say your Jerusalem is Denham Town. Because God has given you governmental authority over Denham Town, whenever you go before the Lord in intercession, whenever you speak to principalities in Denham Town, they are subject to the God in you. They're, they're totally subjected to the God in you, to the authority that you carry. Even if your Jerusalem is all the way in St. Mary, once you begin to open up your mouth, speak, give orders, give instructions, give commands, once you begin to take authority, everything else has to bow to you because you're the one who carry the governmental weight. The authority of God is upon you. And I'm not saying that you'll be the only person. There might be other persons to whom God would have given similar authority or similar measure of authority. But just so you know, when it comes to your Jerusalem, 
you will get away with things that you won't necessarily get away with had you done the same thing in another town or in another area what do I mean maybe you can go into your Jerusalem and shout out repent repent and nobody not pay in a man but perhaps if you were to go to a next town another town maybe half a tree and go shout repent repent people start stone you people start lick you down and persecute you severely glory to god i just use that as a vague example so we can understand that the reception will be different and not only that i believe the zeal of the lord will be manifested at a greater dimension when we're in our Jerusalem again your Jerusalem might not be the place where you're living now it might not be the place where I am living but I want you to think about it and to start thinking about it where is your Jerusalem let's go to the next point Jerusalem was the place where Jesus he had a very serious and deep lamentation the word of God says in Matthew 23 37 to 39 and Luke 13 34 to 35 it's like Jesus started to to prophesy judgment over Jerusalem what I want us to understand is when it comes to our Jerusalem it's like we carry a burden for that place it's a perpetual burden what do I mean for some reason it's like you're always concerned about the reality of the people in that area for some reason you're not even there but it's on your heart for some reason you carry this place in your spirit all the time <clears throat> for me I can give you an example I'm not a Kingstonian I'm from St. Anne that's where I was born and I'm a proud St. Anne person now there's something very significant about my Jerusalem that's what I'm getting to realize because now I'm realizing it's probably my Jerusalem I'm always concerned about the people in that area I'm far far from them physically geographically I am far I'm in Kingston I have a busy life in Kingston why am I in Kingston thinking about some persons who are back in St. Anne? Even people who are not related to me, I'm concerned about. I always want to know how they are doing. How's the church doing? Are people going to church? Are they attending Bible study? Are they attending church on a Sunday? I'm always concerned. Is Sister Pat still going to church? Is she still a Christian or did she backslide? Oh my God. She was told not to return because she got pregnant. And those things, they weigh me down. I carry a burden. It's my Jerusalem. So your Jerusalem is the place for which you carry a burden. It's the burden of God. You always seem to want to lift up the people from that place in prayer. You always seem to want to ensure that things are functioning in that place. It's your Jerusalem. Hallelujah. You always want to make sure that God is being honored. He's being glorified in that place. It's your Jerusalem. You go to bed at night and you even there Florida. Yet still you're dreaming about a little town in rural Jamaica. It's your Jerusalem. You go all the way, the way to Israel, to Canada. You travel the world. But when you lay your head on the pillow at night, who are you thinking of? The people in your Jerusalem. The people back home in a village that is forgotten by many in Jamaica. Many times you're dreaming. Why do you keep seeing yourself in that place? God has traveled the world. Why can't I see myself in Canada? Why can't I see myself in Florida? I go there ever so often. Why do I keep seeing this place in my dreams and in my visions and I don't even live there? Could it be that this place is your Jerusalem? Hallelujah. 
Am I talking truth? I want to know if I'm talking truth because if I'm not, then I can stop. See, your Jerusalem, you don't have a choice as to where your Jerusalem is. Because you couldn't choose where you were born. You couldn't choose where God was going to take ownership of you. It's destiny that determines that. The, the determination or the factors that determine those things, they are eternal. They cannot be fathomed by our physical limited minds and with our limited understandings. But for some unexplainable reason, your Jerusalem is just that place for which you carry a burden. You're always concerned about it, whether you are there physically or not. It is the place for which you are greatly concerned. And no matter what happens, even in the community in which you live, when you hear that something happens in your Jerusalem, it bothers you. It greatly bothers you. I can tell you this. I am in Kingston. This is where I live right now. And I've oftentimes heard of men being killed by the gun and murdered and so on. But if I ever get a call from my family in St. Anne, to say that somebody had chop off or somebody get killed or murdered it bothers me for much longer time than it than it bothers me when i hear of persons in kingston dying why because it's my jerusalem it's my jerusalem i feel like i have somewhat of a responsibility when it comes to that place so my question is where is your Jerusalem? Hallelujah. Let's move on. What again happens in Jerusalem? The Lord had the Passover in Jerusalem. Do you remember what the Passover is? The Passover is, of course, as you know, in Jesus' days, it's the day when he broke bread, drank wine or the blood and and he did that with his disciples and he even washed their feet but we also know that it, the principle or or what happened in in those days was really a, a manifestation of what was foreshadowed in exodus chapter 12 when the children of israel were protected when they placed the blood on their doorposts and lintels who remembers that passover so that redemptive action that restorative action occurred in Jerusalem because Jesus remembered it in Jerusalem. That's where he said to somebody, go to the, the, the man and tell him to prepare the house or go prepare the house. And he had the feast there, Jerusalem. The other thing, Jesus was greatly betrayed in his Jerusalem. I'm going to touch something deep. Did you ever hear Jesus say this? He said, a prophet is not without honor, except where? In his own country. Can I tell you something? Your Jerusalem is not going to be a place that presents you with a platter of sugar and cake and sweets. No. Your Jerusalem might very well be that place where you experience betrayal to the highest degree, rejection to the greatest degree. People will mock you. People will use you, abuse you. People will make you feel like nothing. People will reveal their two-sided ways in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, you'll be shocked. Because some things will take you by surprise. In Jerusalem, it will be bittersweet. You'll have good moments, zealous moments, moments when you feel like you're in control, while there are other times when you'll feel like you are belittled, like you are failing, like you are defeated. Yes, that will happen in your Jerusalem. In his Jerusalem, one of his own betrayed him. Judas Iscariot is his name. Premeditated betrayal occurred in Jesus Jerusalem. Hallelujah. Great level of betrayal. 
Someone who you trust, yes. Persons you least expect to stab you in the back. They'll do it in your Jerusalem. Yes, they'll do it. Hypocrisy will occur in your Jerusalem. People will fail you. They will lie to you in your Jerusalem. It will not be smooth sailing all the time in your Jerusalem. It will not be sweet and dandy all the time in your Jerusalem. In Jesus' days, in his Jerusalem, he suffered betrayal like no other person had suffered. The very people or the very person with whom he entrusted the money of his ministry. Do you know that that is a very sensitive and high responsibility that was given to Judas? Yet, he betrayed him. He betrayed him because of jealousy. He betrayed him because, let me tell you something about Judas's. When they're in your life and when they're in your ministry, they'll follow you and they'll watch you. And if they ever see that you have a gathering and that God is using you to build a momentum, they'll start to become envious of you where they feel like they want that for themselves. That's the purpose of Judas. That's why there was a betrayal. Because they feel as though God needs to promote them too. They don't feel as though they need to work toward the promotion. They feel like it is an overnight thing. Oh, you have the mic. I want the mic too. Oh, you are in charge. I want to be in charge too. It is this envious spirit that causes Judases to thrive. Yes, there cannot be a Judas without having a spirit of jealousy and envy first. And where are they positioned? Are they in your home? No, because if it was in your home, it would have bad enough so bad, but they're in your ministry. They're handling or dealing with the things of God with you. They're partners with you in ministry. So great betrayal will occur in your Jerusalem. It will be that place where you think you have people in whom you can confide, but they will talk your business behind your back. It will happen in your Jerusalem. In your Jerusalem, you'll think you have friends. You'll think you have people who've really genuinely got your back. But they will disappoint you. They'll sell you out. Yes, that's what happens in Jerusalem. Hallelujah. In the days of Jesus, it happened. If it could happen to Jesus, it can happen to you. Then we tab you in your back. Slander you. Gossip you. Call you all kinds of names. Yet, yeah. speak all manner of lies about you, rumors about you. They'll speak things that are not so concerning you in your Jerusalem. You see how funny things are? Because one moment you are so zealous for God because you're at the right place. Again, we said that your Jerusalem is the place over which you have governmental authority. And so you are manifesting as a powerful person. You're manifesting as a successful person, as a person that is brilliant, filled with ideas and is continually evolving. But at the same time, because of all these Judases that are in your life, it's like if you're not careful, people think that you are this bad person. Because your Judases, they, they thrive on speaking rumors. They thrive on making people think that you're a bad person. They'll sell you out because they want the title that you have. Your Judases wish they were in your shoes. They wish they were in your position. So if you have a business, let me tell you what your Judases, your Judases do. They wish they were the ones who own the business. They wish they too had a business like yours. If your business is thriving and not not going for them, your Judases, they wish that it was you, their business thriving and yours was the one for which nothing was going on. Judas. So can you imagine? That's a war fear right there. You're manifesting, but there, there are some people who are pulling you down. You're manifesting, but the weight of jealousy and envy is just pulling you down. War. War. In your Jerusalem. Hallelujah. What is the other thing that happens in your Jerusalem? He was killed. He was killed. He was murdered 
in his Jerusalem. Can I tell you something? They say, have you ever watched the movie, The Passion of the Christ? Do you know why it's called The Passion of the Christ? Jesus' passion was in Jerusalem. His passion was fulfilled in Jerusalem. Jesus Christ, innocent Son of God, in whom was no sin, in whom was no reproach, no defilement, no error, nothing. They murdered him in this place, Jerusalem. The place where he was manifesting from a very young age. The place where he recognized the calling of God. The place where God owned him. The place where unequivocally he was chosen by God. Why? Because God would have strategically positioned people who every now and then would remind him of who he is because of their prophetic utterances and revelations. Hallelujah. So all these things were happening in his Jerusalem. Manifestation of God's hand on his life. Manifestation of the giftings. For we've heard it. He spoke to the, the fig tree and the fig tree dried up. He spoke to the woman who was bent down for 18 years. He said, woman, thou art loosed. And she was loosed indeed. Great miracles, signs and wonders. It was the place where he ensured that the temple of the living God was clean, was conducive for service, was conducive for miracles, for the teaching of the undiluted word. Yet this was the place where he died. Now listen to me. Now you need to listen very carefully. I believe all true believers, teachers, prophets, apostles, evangelists, ministers, pastors, whoever they are, whoever we are, we must get to that point of death. Our passion must be fulfilled and it cannot just happen anywhere I'm realizing. See, God is so meticulous and detailed. He has a purpose for everything. He has a reason why he chose to cause you to be born at Kingston Public Hospital and not at Percy Junior Hospital like where I'm from. He had you born in Kingston and not in Portland. There's a reason for that. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was killed, was murdered, was betrayed in his Jerusalem, but for a good cause. Why am I saying this? You too, if indeed you have decided to follow Christ. Jesus said this in Luke chapter 9. He said, listen, if you desire to truly follow me, this is the first criterion. You've got to take up your cross daily and follow me. The cross represents the place of death. The place of death as it relates to Jesus' life occurred in Jerusalem. So many things will happen for you ministry-wise. Physically, you might be blooming or blossoming because maybe God gave you a business idea and it's thriving. The thing is working for you. But also be prepared to die. Be prepared to die to self. Be prepared to die to your own will and your own desires. Be prepared to live a sacrificial life where you're going to give and take. Where you're going to position yourself to lose sometimes because you won't always win. As in our term. Your Jerusalem is the place of death. 
is the place where you humble yourself to God so much so that you let go of control of certain situations. Even when it seemed like all hope is going to be lost, you just let go because you trust God and you trust his word because his word did say that if you lose your life for his sake, that you will find it again. Did he not say that to us? Your Jerusalem is that place where you give it all up, where you allow your humanity to be processed by God. Hallelujah. And God says, in order for you to please me, I need your spirit to be alive. I need your spirit to be even stronger and to outweigh your humanity. So you must die to flesh. You must die to wants. You must die to desires. You must die to feelings. You must die to many things. So guess what? Your Jerusalem is that place where you begin to die. In one season, things are happening and you feel good and things look good. But in another season, be prepared to lose some things. Be prepared to lose even you. Because some of us, when we come to God, we have some little things in us that have to be plucked out. They have to be removed. Because he can't use us in that position. Our pride sometimes need to go. Our selfish ways need to go. Our tendency to tell lies every now and then, it too needs to go. So we must die. The process of dying is extremely imperative in order for us to live. Can you believe it? You have to die in order to live. So your Jerusalem is that place of death. Dying to self. Dying to your own will. Saying to God finally, thy will be done not mine anymore God but let your will and your will only be done in my life now it's also the place where he was resurrected I'm already seeing a pattern here that many are the afflictions of the righteous but the Lord delivers him out of them all in our Christian walk and in our lifetime we'll have up moments and down and so the ups come, the downs will come. So the ups come and it's a cycle. A cyclic reaction, a cyclic action. So God is saying, although you will die, you're going to live again. Again, God says, if you will take up your cross and follow him. And if you would only allow yourself to die. He says, you will live again. I will give you life. I will give you life and life more abundantly. I came so you might live and not die. I came so you might declare my works in your life, my hand on your life. Hallelujah. So though you die, prepare to be resurrected. Say it, the spirit of the living God. He said, prepare to be resurrected. Because you're not going to stay in that state of death forever. A time will come when you're, you're going to rise up. You're going to come out. So even though you're going through that moment where you feel as though you are nobody. Where you feel belittled. Where you feel overlooked. Where you feel irre irrelevant. You feel unimportant. You feel forgotten, you feel empty, you feel lonely. You feel, you feel so much that you don't even know anymore what you feel. I'm saying to you that a time will come when you will rise again. You will be resurrected out of it again. So your Jerusalem is not just the place where you manifest. It's not just the place where you die. But it's also going to be the place we're in front of the people who have mocked you. In front of the people who thought you were a madman or a mad woman. Because you're always saying hallelujah and Jesus. And what do you saw? Are you full of yourself, sir? Are you so godly and holy? 
in front of those same people, he's going to cause you to rise again. The word of God says, thou preparest a table before me in the very presence of my enemies. So in the very presence of people who wish you will just die, in the very presence of people who wish you will fail, who wish you will stutter, who wish that they had something for which they could laugh. God says, I will cause you to rise even in their midst. God says, I will cause you to flourish even in dry times. That's what I do. I prepare tables in the presence of not your friends because your friends already believe in you. Your friends already have a revelation of who you are. Your friends already get a glimpse of where you're going. So they're not taken by surprise. The enemies are the ones who don't know you, who, who choose to judge you based on your outward and judge you based on your current circumstance. So God says, I'm going to prepare a table before you, meaning I'm going to bless you. I'm going to prosper you and I'm going to cause you to thrive in the very presence while they're alive, not while they're dead, but while they're alive, I'm going to silence them and cause them to eat back their words because they wished you evil, but I meant good for you. They cursed you without even realizing that they cannot curse that which I have already blessed. The other thing that occurred in Jerusalem is this I'm, I'm winding things up now God said he said to his disciples stay in Jerusalem if you go into the book of Acts chapter 1 to about 500 disciples he said tarry in Jerusalem and wait for what the promise what was the promise the Holy Spirit Matthew 11 3 tells us that he's the one who baptizes us with fire in your Jerusalem I can tell you this hallelujah to your name Jesus hallelujah to your name mighty God watch this do you remember that Jerusalem is the place where the temple was erected what does that mean? Jerusalem, as in Jesus' life and ministry, was the place where the, the, the presence of the, God, of the Lord was. It was the, the host of the presence of the Lord, Jerusalem. And here it is. Jesus is saying to his disciples, tarry in Jerusalem, do not leave. They tarried for some 40 days after he left, after he ascended. It was in Jerusalem that they received the infilling or baptism of the Holy Spirit. So your Jerusalem is that place where no matter how dry you feel, no matter how cast down your soul is, you can always be rest assured that when you go to that place, you will find God for his presence is there. Hallelujah. And I tell you, it doesn't even have to be in a physical building. It could be on a spot. Do you remember Jacob? He called the place Luz Bethel. He renamed it Bethel. There wasn't a tent there. There wasn't a, a building or a structure made of brick there. It was just a spot. The word of God said he took up a stone and he used the stone to make a pillar. So we understand that it was in the open. So your Jerusalem doesn't have to have a house. It doesn't have to be a building. It doesn't have to have a physical structure. It can just be a spot. It can just be a broad area. But it is that place where you know for sure, even if today you lied, even if today you committed the worst sin, rest assured when you go to that place, you will find the presence of God because it is your Jerusalem. It's the place where his presence never leaves it's the place of covenant the word of god says in luke chapter 2 
that when his parents brought him to the, the temple, they presented him to God. Your Jerusalem is where you were presented to God. And maybe you weren't presented to him as a child. Maybe it was when you were an adult that you were presented to God and God owned you as of that moment or day. But whenever you go back to that place, hallelujah, the place of covenant, the place where God said of you, you are mine, I call you by name. When you go to that place, you shall surely find his presence. Perhaps that's your Jerusalem. Because even when a praise is not coming, when you get to that place, his presence can be found. Even when the words are not coming, you want to pray, but you don't even know where to start. You don't even know how to start. The presence finds you, your Jerusalem. Things don't come easily when you get there or before you get there. But once you get there, God's presence just makes a difference in your life. It's your Jerusalem. Where is your Jerusalem? Are you already starting to figure out where your Jerusalem is? Are you already starting to reminisce and reflect on your Jerusalem? Where are the places or where is that place where whenever you go, you find God? Even if you're trying to run from him, Whenever you go to that place, God sends somebody to talk to you. It's your Jerusalem. Hallelujah. Where is that place in your life? Where even when you're going off track and you know it, but you just won't admit it. God just happens to use even a foolish person to speak back hope and direction in your spirit. Where is your Jerusalem? Hallelujah. Can I tell you why it's important that you start to figure out where your Jerusalem is? It ought to be a place that you cherish. And you have to understand it is the place where your passion will be realized. It's the place where your passion will manifest. So if your passion is still bottle up, bottling up in you and it's not yet manifested, then refuse to die until it happens. Hallelujah. And perhaps you are on your way back to your Jerusalem. You're just not there yet. And that's why you have to be so protective and careful as to the decisions that you make. Because it is important for you to get back to your Jerusalem. Because there's work there for you to do. Where is your Jerusalem? Is it in Kingston? Is it in Florida? Where is it? Is it in Montego Bay? Is it in St. Thomas? Is it in St. Elizabeth? Is it in St. Mary? Where is your Jerusalem? Is it in Clarendon? Is it in Portland? Is it in Manchester? Where is your Jerusalem? I can speak for me. I know where mine is, but do you know where yours is? Your Jerusalem. Hallelujah. Glory to God. God said to his disciples, the Lord Jesus instructed them. He said, I'm giving you a commission. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to preach the gospel. But there is a particular order in which I'd like this to be done. I want you to preach the gospel first. Where? Guess where? in Jerusalem then when you deal with it in Jerusalem then you can launch out a little further into Samaria then he said after Samaria you can go as far as Judea then when you touch Judea you can go as far as the world the nations the globe but you must begin in your Jerusalem. Your Jerusalem. You must manifest in your Jerusalem. I know many of us, we're desiring to, to go elsewhere. We're desiring to launch out. But God wants us in our Jerusalem because there is some work and much work that needs to be done. 
in our Jerusalem before we start to launch out to even further into the deep. There are some people in your Jerusalem that are waiting to hear Jesus. Just his name, they're waiting to be called. There are some people in your Jerusalem who are longing to hear the word of truth because there are some bar Jesus that are going around telling them all kinds of lies, trying to indoctrinate them with doctrines of demons. So your Jerusalem needs you, say it, the spirit of the living God. Your Jerusalem needs water, it's dry. Cause the word is not being taught, it's not being spoken, it's not being delivered. So you must return, you must go, you must manifest in your Jerusalem. God is saying, the church in your Jerusalem needs you. The church is cold. The church is lukewarm. The church is on one particular level. I need you to go back. I need you to go in my spirit. I need you to go in my strength. I need you to go with my authority. And might I add my governmental authority. And when you go back into that place, because I have placed such a heavy anointing upon you, when you open up your mouth, when you go into the temples and in the churches, and you begin to say, thus saith God, there shall be transformation in the lives of my people. For I have chosen you, I have called you, I have appointed you, and I have ordained you. You must go back to Jerusalem. For there is purpose and passion to be realized in that place. Where is your Jerusalem? God wants us to start setting back some things in order in our Jerusalem. Yes, even in his church, many things are happening. Lots of doctrines that are not of his are being taught and God wants to use you to fix it. Lots of prosperity messages are coming from his pulpit and God wants to use you to fix that. Just like Jesus, he went into the temple in Jerusalem. He saw the money changers, those who were gambling and doing all kinds of things and business in the Lord's house. You too, he needs to go into your place over which you have authority and take authority and take a stance on his behalf. Because God wants to move, but it's going to require us physical bodies for him to move. He's a spirit. He needs bodies to take up things. He needs bodies to move things and to put them in order. He needs a mouth through which he can speak. That's why Isaiah saw him and Isaiah got to hear a conversation and he deliberately heard it. God purposed for him to hear the conversation. He said, send me, send me God. Why didn't God just go there and do what he needed to do himself? Because he's a spirit, he needs a body. God says, I've chosen you. I have chosen you. And there is work, much work for you to do in your Jerusalem. Hallelujah. You don't know it yet, but you've been given authority over that place. Many come in and they've been chased out. And I'm not saying that there won't be times when you too will be rejected and you too will be cast out. But I'm saying that spiritually, you will do a lot of damage in that place. Your Jerusalem. Maybe if I were to come to your Jerusalem and do certain things, I probably even get sick because of the attack and the backlash. But because it is your Jerusalem, you've been anointed to take care of business spiritually there. Nothing will happen to you. You don't need to pray a prayer about, oh, I pray against backlash. I pray that so-and-so will not come after me. No, because you've been given authority. And when you go, you don't go alone. You go with an entire camp of angels. Battalion of angels are with you. You're not alone. Hallelujah. So God is saying, where is your Jerusalem? 
because he wants to send back some people to their Jerusalem. You see, some of us, we have been postponing and postponing, not realizing that our time has come to go back. Hallelujah. Did you know that? There is a time and season appointed for your return. Yes, remember how there are many times when Jesus could have gone into Jerusalem, but he would say to Peter and to his disciples, my time has not yet come. Do we remember? Because there's a set time for this manifestation. There is a set time for the realization, yeah, of passion and so on. There's a set time. But for many of us, the time has long passed. It gone long time. God has been waiting for us to move by faith. To go to our Jerusalems. He wants to use us to put back things in order. He wants to use us to speak back life and to breathe life. Into families. Into churches. Into communities. Your Jerusalem is waiting on you. Your Jerusalem is ready. It awaits you. It has been crying out before God. It has been lamenting before God. For it is waiting for you to come and rescue it. Shadim, what are you saying? Did you not hear Paul talk about the fact that the earth waits, awaits the, the manifestation of the children of God with birth pangs? So it's like the earth is so longing for the manifestation, for there to be healing and a resolve. That is like it's physically crying out like a woman that is high in her pregnancy. Like she's going through some contractual pains. Your Jerusalem is going through that for it's waiting for you. You don't get to choose your Jerusalem. For if, if it was up to many of us, we would choose cherry gardens, don't it? We would choose red hills. We would choose Jackson Hill. We would choose Beverly Hills. But I thank God that his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are so far above our thoughts too. We don't get to choose. It's already there. So now we need to say, God, where is my Jerusalem? Reveal it to me, Lord. Father, even now as your people lift up their hands, I pray that you will speak directly to their spirits. Cause them, Lord God, to realize and to get a revelation of their Jerusalem. Cause them, Lord God, to understand the passion with which you have anointed them. Father, I pray that you'll help them to now dream with understanding so that when they wake up in the mornings or when they wake from a dream they'll understand what they saw they'll no longer ask why do i keep seeing myself at xyz place they'll begin to realize that xyz place is the place for my purpose to be manifested and realized so, Father God Almighty, I pray, Jesus, that you will give your people a great measure of boldness to go, to go, to go, to go, to go and release captives, to go and heal broken hearts, to go and set things back in order and in motion, to go to go God with fresh zeal with fresh energy fresh anointing fresh revelation of who you are anoint them also with your presence so they can know that surely God is with them many of the persons who live in our Jerusalems they are so accustomed to coldness and dryness and lukewarmness that they don't know what the true presence of God feels like. And so, Father, I pray that you would give us the boldness, the zeal, the power, the confidence to go back to our Jerusalem.
Jerusalem in your name to be used, oh God, without limits in your name. Father God Almighty, set us apart from now so that we can do according to your will and your plan, not according to the plan of man. Father, empower us to carry out your agenda only, not our agenda, not the agenda of human beings, but, our, but your, your agenda only, God. Father God Almighty, mobilize our spirits. Mobilize our inward men to move, to go, to act, to stop delaying, to stop procrastinating. But may we go finally, may we go finally, because perhaps if we go, we can save a life. Perhaps if we go, we can save a marriage. Perhaps if we go, we can save a family. Perhaps if we go, we can save a community. Just one person he needs. He said, behold, I look for a man to make up the edge. Behold, I look for him to be that door so that I do not destroy the nation. Could you be that one person that he's looking for to spear an entire village? Did you know that he could cause fire to just destroy an entire community? Did you know that? Or have you not heard of the fires in Australia? It's not impossible. One bushfire and an entire community is destroyed. Could you be the one that he's waiting for to save that community because of your intercession, because of the sincerity with which you will go and speak and act? Could you be the one? I hear some of you saying, I wanna be used. I see you, Sister Stephanie. Is there anybody else? Is there anybody else who wants to go but you just don't think you have the, the courage? You, you feel like you need an ounce of boldness. You, you, you feel the tugging but, but you, you feel like you need something else. You need an addition. Is there anybody else? Can you indicate? Anybody else? Father God, let us pray. Glory to God. Hallelujah, Jesus. We bless your name, God, for you are worthy. Father, I thank you that this is, I declare, this is the generation that seeks thy face. Oh, Jacob, that seeks thee. This is the generation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Kashunda Rabasi Kandia. So, right now, mighty God, even as I connect with you, even as I connect with supernatural intelligence, even as I connect right now with the heavenlies even as I connect with your mind even as I connect with your divine will and purpose Father God I pray that every single person under the hearing of my voice who desires to go to their Jerusalem who desires to do that which you have caused them to do and not necessarily what man have called them to do. I pray, Father God, that you'll pour out of your spirit upon them afresh. Let there be fresh fire right now. 
Hallelujah. I hear somebody crying out. I hear somebody speaking in their heavenly language. You haven't used it in a while, but you're using it now. There is a stirring occurring in your belly bottom. Once upon a time, you used to be afraid, but you're not feeling fearful at this moment. For there is an outpouring right now that is occurring. And so you are speaking. Mate Kosandai, Jesus. Mobilize them, Lord God. Activate them by your power. Empower them, Jesus, to speak. Empower them to confront Pharaohs. Empower them to confront Herods. Empower them, Jesus Christ, to confront Ahaz. Empower them to speak truth to the Hezekiahs that are in their lives. Empower them, Jesus Christ, to speak to Potiphar. Kabrom Sambaba Shataraba. Empower them, Jesus, to speak to the great and the ordinary alike. Empower them to take a stance in your name. Empower them to take decisive actions in your name. Empower them, Jesus Christ, to stand for holiness, to promulgate holiness and righteousness, even if they are the only person standing. Oh, God, empower them to remember always that there are more that are with them than those that are against them. Empower them to remember God. That the weapons of their warfare, they are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Empower them, God, to remember that the Egyptians that they see today, they shall see no more forever. Empower them, God. Even as they go back, even as they go back, empower them, set them apart, set them apart. I pray for every person that has not yet given their life to the Lord. As a matter of fact, will you give your life to the Lord? Did you know that Jesus Christ, he came in flesh became man temporarily forsook his status as a citizen of heaven to take on earthly citizenship for you and I he became humble to the point of death for you and I he was mocked belittled betrayed slandered, murdered, so you might live and have everlasting life. Will you therefore at least acknowledge the sacrifice that was made for you? Will you give your life to Jesus knowing that you need his blood covering even in this pandemic. All I want to do is just to offer you Jesus. That's all I want to do. Will you accept him as your Lord, as your Savior? Will you accept him? Will you surrender to him? Knowing that he was wounded for your transgressions. He was bruised for your iniquity. The chastisement for your peace was upon him. Will you give your heart to him? Will you? Do you believe? The word says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. I hear people say every day, oh, I fear God and God, God, God. 
but they don't believe. It starts with you believing that Jesus did die for your sins. That he was murdered, but he was resurrected in victory. And the victory that Jesus accomplished, it belongs to you and I. It is for you and I today. You can be a beneficiary of his victory. Please, do not allow tomorrow to come without you giving your heart to God. Could you be someone for whom death is intended tonight? What if you close your eyes and don't wake up tomorrow? What would be your excuse? Will you say you've never been told, you've never been warned? Will you say that? When you would have heard the words moments before, Jesus is knocking at your door. He's asking you, will you let me in? I've come to change your life. I've come to give you life. I didn't come to steal anything from you. I came to make a difference in your life. I know you are empty and you're feeling lonely, but I promise you, I will fill your life. And I know that I am a spirit, but I know how to meet your needs. I know how to fill you and fulfill you and satisfy you. I know how to do that. Do you trust him to do that? Can you trust him to do that? I've trusted him to do it and he has done so well. He has exceeded my expectations. He has done exceedingly, abundantly, above all that I could ever imagine or think. And if he has done it for me, he can do it for you. So Father, I pray that you'll save the individual that says they want you. Touch the heart, create in them a clean heart and renew a right spirit within them. Cast them not away, God, from your presence and do not take your spirit from them totally. Father God, cover them, change them, transform them. In Jesus' name. Go ahead and share because we're done. If you have any questions, you can let me know. As a matter of fact, feel free to send a personal message, a direct message. Every time I start my videos, I start them looking cool and I usually finish looking like this. Why? Because it's not a show. It's not a show. It's not a show. It's not for beauty. It's not a beauty competition. It's not a parade. It's not. It's the work of the Lord. I'm not the one who is to be glorified, but He. And so, yes, you ought to see me looking like this. And I don't care because I'm not competing with anyone. I'm manifesting just like you are manifesting. And you gotta be a God pleaser and not a man pleaser. There are too many men pleasers out there. People living their lives to please people to look good for people, to sound good for people. 
They're not concerned about whether or not they are pleasing God. And if pleasing God means sweating, then that's fine. If pleasing God means looking ugly, that's fine. And I wish many persons would get to that place where it's no longer about the outward, what you look like, what you sound like. It's time for God to be glorified. It's time for God to get the honor out of our lives, out of our speech, and out of our deeds. Hallelujah. I could go on and on and on again. For him, I live. What say you? For him, I live. What say you? It's not easy, but it's worth it. I just feel his presence just now backing me up, reminding me that I'm not alone. And I know he's reminding you too that you're not alone. For he knows it's not easy. He knows that you have to go through the fire. He knows that even as you go to your Jerusalem and go through your Jerusalem experiences, that it's not easy. But he has given you grace. And that's what grace does. Grace gives you strength to deal with the things you wouldn't have otherwise had strength to deal with. Grace. And the more you obey him, is the more grace will be added unto you. Hallelujah. We bless your name, God. We bless your name. We bless your name. Hallelujah to your name, God. Hallelujah to your name, God. You're worthy, God. You're worthy, God. Hallelujah to your name. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. Hallelujah, God. You're worthy, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Because it was not easy, and it's still not easy, God, but it is worth it. It is worth it, God. It's worth it. It's worth it. Hallelujah. The lonely days, they are worth it. The days of being misunderstood, they are worth it, God. The days, Lord God, of not having anybody to turn to, they are worth it, God. The days of feeling empty and not knowing the difference between feeling empty and feeling lonely, they are worth it, God. The days of feeling broken and totally insignificant, they are worth it, God. The days when my only company and our only company was just you and your angels, they are worth it, God. They are worth it. They are worth it. They are worth it. It will be worth it after all, I tell you. It's not easy. It's not. But it will be worth it. It will be worth it. 
There are days when you will not have friends. There are days when you won't even know who to trust. You won't even know who is really with you. There are days when people will just leave without even you understanding why. The Jerusalem experience is not easy, but it will be worth it. The Lord bless you. Thank you so much for joining and for sharing. And I really hope that one person received, that one person's life was impacted. I hope to God that not only were persons blessed, but may somebody's life be impacted tonight where there will be a change. There will be a change. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. I love him because his word says he uses the simple things to confound the wise and the weak to confound the strong. I thank God that he knows me when I'm most vulnerable. I thank God that he has allowed me to be so broken that I have no other choice but to be humble before you. That's when you get to your Jerusalem. You will die. You will die to many things in your Jerusalem. You will lose many things. You will lose many people in your Jerusalem. But he'll give you the grace, I'm sure. So may you leave here tonight with added grace, added strength, added levels and dimensions of boldness. May you receive that tonight. I thank God for you. May he cover you under his blood thoroughly. And may persons who have not yet taken him seriously begin to do so. I don't know what else to say to you but that. I love you. But the Lord loves you so much more. I don't know when I'm going to come on again. Maybe tomorrow, maybe Saturday. I don't know. I didn't plan to come on. I was inspired to come on. And as I'm inspired, I'll just obey God. Yes, Kevin. We thank him for bearing our sins and shame. Yeah. 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 God bless you. Just be obedient to God. Be obedient to Him. You wonder why there are many persons who are powerful and God is just using them mightily and God keeps on taking them from one level to the next. You think that they have it easy? They don't. They don't have it easy. The people who God is really using and is really elevating in Him are not necessarily people who have a lot of followers. Did you know that? There are people who are highly anointed. They're given a lot of authority. 
but they don't necessarily have a bunch of followers millions and billions they don't but there are people who, who when they open up their mouths there's fire lives are impacted change occurs manifestation of God's glory presence and power occurs many persons are envious of people who are way up there not knowing that they would have to go through the process including going through their Jerusalem moments can you imagine people want what they have but they're not willing to endure what they've gone through isn't it unfair so I'm saying to you you have your Jerusalem opportunity are you gonna make use of it for some of us the time has long passed so we have a lot of making up to do do it as quickly as you can do it quickly God is waiting the people are waiting the church in the area is waiting a whole generation is waiting a nation is waiting do not be fearful of people's faces do not be fearful of their voices do not be afraid for he is with you he will never leave you nor forsake you hi Maxine hi Stephanie hi Kevin hi Janet princess Shane um, Brenda Charmaine Carrie Baker Janet good evening I'm gonna hang up now cuz I've said it all tomorrow God's willing I might be on again it depends on if I get an inspiration to say something or to talk about something so again think about it where's your Jerusalem start thinking on it today I'm sure you have an assignment there don't wait it out for too long there's a time appointed and I'm saying that while there are some of us whose time has not yet come there are some of you whose time has long passed it has long gone so think about it and may the Holy Spirit open up your spiritual eyes and understanding so you might see and know that place that special place have a great great night bless you oh by the way remember you can actually follow my youtube channel Shadeen and Lynn, please do sign up and also check out Prayer Purpose Passion. It has some awesome, awesome inspirational and motivational videos. I've been getting a lot of feedbacks in that regard. They're short but very impactful. So check out Prayer Purpose Passion. All right, later.